the bizarre case of Paulette Jabara Farah. The question, who killed Paulette, continues to ring in the minds of people even after 11 years. I will be taking you through the timeline leading to the disappearance and death of Paulette so that you can conclude and come to a verdict for yourself. Today's story also gives us a look into the corrupt activities of the state of Mexico, including their mishandling of a rather delicate situation. Greetings and welcome to our channel. In today's video, I bring you the strange case of Paulette. As always, make sure you subscribe to support our channel. Also, in order not to miss a single one of our uploads, press the alarm bell and turn on YouTube notifications on your phone. Paulette Jabara Farah was born on the 20th of July 2005 to Luzette Farah and Moriko Jabara. She was a four-year-old kindergarten student who went missing from her home in Mexico. Her mother is an attorney, while her father is a prominent businessman. The little girl came from a rich and influential family in Mexico. On the 21st of March 2010, Paulette, together with her sister and father, arrived in their hometown, located in Hawix, Quilacan. The trio had travelled from Valle de Bravo. Lisette was waiting for her children so she could put them to bed as it was already night time. After she did, she and the rest of the household eventually went to bed as well. On the morning of the 22nd, one of Paulette's two nannies, Erika, was going about her daily routine, which included waking Paulette up. However, upon entering the room, Paulette was nowhere to be found. Erika and her sister, Martha, the other nanny, searched for Paulette. Martha said, I looked for her in the bathroom, under the bed and in the closet. I couldn't find her and decided to search the parents' bedroom as well, and then her sister's room. And then I searched her room once more. Both Erica and her sister were employed to keep the apartment neat and take good care of the two children. That morning, the nannies prepared Paulette's sister for school and waited with her until the bus came for her at around 7am. It was at 8 when Erica found Paulette's room empty with no Paulette in sight. The nanny then alerted Paulette's mother and they started searching the apartment. They searched everywhere for Paulette in the apartment, in the housing complex, the elevators, the pool, the playground, and even the parking lot without any luck. When Mariko heard about his daughter's disappearance, he notified his sister, who called the Hoekskwalakan authorities. The household claimed to have searched everywhere in the apartment building, but still could not find the little girl. Yet, there was no sign of a break-in or a kidnapping. The locks on the doors and windows were untouched. There was nothing missing either. The building where the family lived had surveillance, and when it was checked, there was no footage of Paulette leaving the house or being kidnapped. Paulette had a motor and language disability, so it was impossible for her to go out on her own. She had just vanished into thin air, or so they thought. Paulette's case was brought to the attention of the high authorities in the city, mainly because of the influence her family had in the country. The mayor, Alfredo del Marzo Marza, alerted the Attorney General of the State of Mexico, Alberto Buzbar, who published a picture of the little girl detailing her age, appearance and physical shortcomings. Arlette Farah, Paulette's aunt, also posted her photo on social media and within a short time, Paulette's case became a national spectacle. On the evening of Paulette's disappearance, Lizette appeared on television and pleaded with the supposed kidnappers to bring back her daughter. In her words, whoever was responsible could leave Paulette in a mall or a crowded place and it would not incur my wrath. She went as far as to putting up billboards and placing advertisements on television and public transport. Paulette's father also appeared in the media and asked for his daughter's return. Mariko claimed that on the morning of his daughter's disappearance, he was at work. On the 29th of March, Paulette's parents and her two nannies, Erika and Martha Casamorro, were put under restriction order because of the falsehood and the inconsistencies of their statements. Attorney Alberto Basbar said, each one of them had a certain moment that falsified their statements, which has made it difficult to know the truth of the facts and clarify a firm line of investigation. The next day, Paulette's parents were kept at the Mexican police station for many hours before being transferred to a hotel to undergo their restriction order. The police placed a lot of blankets in the home to reconstruct the events leading up to the girl's disappearance. What they found next is something that continued to baffle both experts and laymen alike. At 2 a.m. on the 31st of March, Paulette's dead body was found in the very room and bed she went missing from. Her body was found wedged in between the mattress and the foot of her bed. The cause of death, 
asphyxiation. Well, that's what her autopsy result said. The video footage for when Paulette was found was leaked to the public. One of the forensic experts could be heard saying she was severely beaten as he looked at the stained sheets. However, the attorney denied this statement, saying that her death was purely accidental. Paulette usually slept with an orthopedic cloth around her mouth to keep her from sleeping with her mouth open. In the autopsy report, Paulette had food about five hours before her death. There were signs of a blow to her left elbow and knee, presumably after falling off her bed. There were no signs of physical or sexual abuse either. The report went on to say she died between five to nine days before she was found. This means Paulette could have been dead from the very first day she was missing. Also, there was no indications of drugs or toxic substances in her body. The conclusion was that Paulette, by her own means, moved on the bed and accidentally fell headlong into a space at the foot of her bed where she died of asphyxiation and subsequently remained there unnoticed for nine days. This is what many people couldn't understand, and I'll tell you why. In the days after Paulette's disappearance, many people visited the family. Lizette's friend Amanda De La Rosa even slept in the little girl's room, which had not been properly preserved by the detectives. The nannies made the bed several times, both for Lizette's friend and for interviews Lizette granted in the room. The investigators were even allowed to use the little girl's restroom. If you remember, the police initially searched the house when Paulette was declared missing. In all that time, no one saw Paulette under the bed or even the stained sheets that were found. It even seemed a deliberate attempt was made to contaminate the crime scene with all the people going and coming. In Erica's own words, she said, in fact, if it had been like that, I think we would have noticed, since thousands of people came to look for her. The bed was made, I never saw the mattress pulled back, I didn't even see a bundle or anything. It doesn't make sense to me that the body could have been there since Monday. Let's go back to the video. After the detectives made that statement, he removed the blanket and found the stained sheets. He and his partner then took out all the sheets and found Paulette's body hidden. A whole lot of other specialists have questioned the authenticity of the video. To them, the video felt like a performance of a script and not a real-time incident. Both the position of the camera and the forensic experts appear like it was staged. They also didn't show any shock at finding the little girl's body, almost like they knew it was already there. What was more even odd was the time of the search. It was 2 a.m. Who performs a search at 2 a.m.? Anyways, Paulette's first autopsy report puts her death at March 28, but was later changed to March 21 to 26, upon a request from an unidentified high authority figure. Paulette's mother became a suspect. A recording of Lizette and her older daughter popped up. In the audio, Lizette was heard telling her daughter not to say anything about her little sister's disappearance, to which her daughter said, why mum? And Lizette replied, because otherwise they will blame us for stealing her or that we took her away to be stolen. Lizette said that her words were taken out of context and that did not mean that she had anything to do with the case. Mariko in an interview believed it was not an accident. There was no evidence, so Lizette could not be arrested. In one of the interviews in Paulette's room, a pyjama was seen neatly folded on the bed. It was the same set the little girl was found in. It could have been that the girl has multiple pyjama sets like that, However, you can't deny it seems suspicious. Lizette was also so calm and cool, even unaffected in most of her interviews, despite having to go through her daughter's things. She was later diagnosed with having a personality disorder. The theory was that Paulette's physical disabilities had become a burden on the mentally unstable woman who had then killed her to relieve her of that burden. This came across as exactly what it was, a theory. Paulette had two nannies who took care of most of the needs and therefore she was well out of the way of her mother. On April 6, Paulette was buried at Pantheon Francis's in Mexico. Her father's family was not in attendance due to an agreement both families had in place. Seven years later, the body was dug up and cremated after the authorities established that it was no longer considered evidence. After so many years, people are still not convinced that Paulette's death was an unfortunate accident. They believe that her parents, nannies, or even the authorities who were involved know the person who did it, or at the very least, the real circumstances surrounding Paulette's death. We have come to the end of today's video. Do you also think it was just an accident? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to like and share this video with your friends and family. And thanks for watching, and we'll see you all again 
next time.